some of our patients were stating that they did use YouTube as a resource to find out more information about nail biopsies. And we were curious to know whether that information was reliable for patients and also for medical students, residents, and even attendings who want to learn more about nail biopsies. That was Dr. Sherry Lipner, and this is Dermatology Weekly. I'm the voice of MD Edge Podcast's Nick Andrews. Welcome to episode 59 of Derm Weekly, where we bring you the latest in dermatology news, followed by peer-to-peer conversations with clinical and research experts in dermatology. This week, infectious diseases experts are shifting terminology for COVID-19, and cardiology groups are pushing back on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for COVID-19. And coming up later in the peer-to-peer portion of the show, Dr. Sherry Lipner joins Dr. Vincent DeLeo to talk about the quality and the credibility of nail biopsy videos that you can find on YouTube. Remember that this episode comes with show notes that include biographical information for our guests, as well as Dr. DeLeo, as well as links to the news stories that you hear in the news portions of the episodes. You can contact the show by emailing us at podcast at mdh.com, and you can also interact with MDH Dermatology on Twitter. You can find the links to the email address and the Twitter handle in the show notes as well. Before we get to -to peer-to-peer, this is what's making news in dermatology. We begin this episode with one expert's look into what's coming next in the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Joseph S. Eastern is a longtime author of Managing Your Practice, a column in Dermatology News. He's also a practicing dermatologist in northern New Jersey. Dr. Eastern asks a simple question. What now? That's the glaring question for many physicians trying to keep their private practices viable. The answer depends on how the pandemic plays out. Dr. Eastern says that what's coming next depends on two properties of the virus. First, is the virus seasonal? He points out that coronaviruses tend to be seasonal with waning strength in the warmer months. As of this recording, summer is approaching in the Northern Hemisphere. The second factor is the duration of immunity. To determine that, healthcare professionals will need serologic tests and to administer them quickly and widely. Dr. Eastern says that even if there is a summer hiatus, seasonal viruses typically return as winter approaches it is possible that we could still be dealing with the first wave of the pandemic when the second wave approaches this autumn. He sees two possibilities. First, assuming we luck into a seasonal reprieve in the next few weeks, infection rates should drop, which could allow our private practices to return towards some semblance of normal. If healthcare workers and patients alike can be convinced that the offices and clinics are safe, That could be accomplished as part of our overall preparation for a potential winter recurrence by checking every patient's temperature at the waiting room door. Similarly, all students should get a daily temperature check at school, as should all commuters, airline passengers, and individuals at any sizable gathering. Every fever should trigger a COVID-19 test, and every positive test should launch aggressive contact tracing and quarantines. Meanwhile, treatments and vaccines should get fast-tracked. He asks, what will you do if this virus outlasts emergency funds from the Paycheck Protection and Economic Injury Disaster programs? He says that you need to start doing the math for yourself and for your practice. It is time to figure out how many patients you need to see per day to break even, and at which point you and your practice will run out of funding. Dr. Eastern concludes with the following advice. Address the hypotheticals now. Consult with your own attorneys, your own accountants, and other advisors. You can read more from Dr. Eastern's column by clicking the link in the podcast notes. And infectious diseases experts discussed shifting the term asymptomatic to pre-symptomatic for COVID-19 in April. Dr. Carlos Del Rio is a professor of medicine at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta in the Division of Infectious Diseases. He said that pre is really the correct terminology because it's not that patients aren't asymptomatic. Rather, they develop symptoms later and start transmitting the virus between 24 to 48 hours before they develop symptoms. Some studies suggest that 6 to 12% of transmissions occur during the pre-symptomatic stage. 
Dr. Jean Marazzo is director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at UAB in Alabama. She noted that earlier on in the pandemic, the pre-symptomatic phase could have been missed because no one realized the wide range of symptoms that COVID-19 has. Dr. Marazzo said that a lot of people were refused testing because they were not showing the classic signs of the disease at that time. But it's now clear that the wide range of symptoms is quite different. Notably, the loss of smell is very characteristic and specific to COVID-19. Dr. Marazzo said that she can't think of another common viral infection that causes loss of smell before other symptoms are observable. The ID experts also addressed racial disparities surrounding COVID-19, and they announced guidelines for diagnosis and treatment. Dr. Del Rio said that racial disparities in the U.S. are not new, but racial disparities in this disease are quite stark. Dr. Marazzo noted that in Alabama, around 20% of the population is African-American, yet almost 40% of COVID-19 deaths are occurring among African-Americans. She pointed out that the biggest disparities are coming from Illinois and Michigan, where less than 15% of the population is African-American, but 70% of the deaths are from African-Americans. While the data require more analysis, doctors Del Rio and Marazzo noted that social distancing is probably a greater challenge in urban areas. The IDSA also announced new guidelines, which you can read in full by clicking the link in the show notes. And finally today, the nation's leading cardiology associations urged caution with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for patients with COVID-19 who have cardiovascular disease. In a joint statement, the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and the Heart Rhythm Society said that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin have been touted for potential prophylaxis for COVID-19. Both drugs are listed as definite causes of torsade de point and increase the other arrhythmias as well as sudden death. The statement came amid ongoing promotion of the drugs by the Trump administration despite the lack of strong data. The joint group said that in addition to underlying cardiovascular disease, seriously ill patients often have comorbidities that can increase risk of serious arrhythmias, including hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, fever, and systemic inflammation. They recommended withholding the drugs in patients with baseline QT prolongation or with known congenital long QT syndrome. They recommended monitoring cardiac rhythm and QT interval and withdrawing hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin if QTC exceeds 500. Dr. Robert Harrington is president and chair of the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. He said that the urgency of COVID-19 must not diminish the scientific rigor with which we approach COVID-19 treatment. He continued by noting that while these medications may work against COVID-19 individually or in combination, recommending caution for patients with existing cardiovascular disease. And that's what's new in dermatology for the week of April 12th, 2020. We'll be right back with Peer to Peer. Welcome back to Dermatology Weekly. I am Nick Andrews. It's time now for Peer to Peer with Dr. Vincent DeLeo. Today we're talking to Dr. Sherry Lipner about nail biopsy videos on YouTube. Dr. Lipner is from Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Lipner. Thanks so much, Dr. DeLeo. Great to be here. So let's get started. Are you hearing that your patients are referring to YouTube for information about their medical procedures? And what about medical students? So the reason we decided to do this study was because some of our patients were stating that they did use YouTube as a resource to find out more information about nail biopsies. And we were curious to know whether that information was reliable for patients and also for medical students, residents, and even attendings who want to learn more about nail biopsies. So to delve into this, in your uh, article, you analyzed the top 10 videos showing nail biopsy procedures on YouTube. Can you tell us now how you selected the videos? Yes. So we used the search term nail biopsy, and we filtered it by relevance and rating using the default YouTube algorithm. 
And then we narrow down the data to the top 40 hits for the search term and with filter coupling. We then viewed and sorted the nail biopsy procedures and categorized them by being produced either by a physician or other healthcare provider. So we were able to then eliminate and have just 10 of the top hits because many of them were irrelevant. So they were blogs or uh, PowerPoint presentations, or we were unable to identify a reliable author. So the, the videos you used then were produced by physicians, is that correct? For the most part, yes. So we had board-certified dermatologists, as well as a couple of plastic surgeons, and there was a board-certified podiatrist. Two of them were healthcare providers, according to the videos, but we couldn't identify exactly who they were. So would you find out about the quality of the content of those videos? We used the discern criteria for evaluation in the study because it has been used in prior studies and is validated. And the discern criteria looks at things like, is the video or publication relevant? Is there clear information? Is there a reliable source? Is it balanced and unbiased? And after applying those criteria, there is an overall score going from one to five, one having serious or extensive shortcomings, three having potentially important but not serious shortcomings, and then a five would be very, very minimal shortcomings. So we applied that criteria to the biopsy videos that we analyzed. And what did you find? We found that out of the 10 videos met our criteria, most of them got very low discern scores, Um, so one or two. None got fours or fives, and there was one video that we graded a three, which is sort of moderate and just has some shortcomings. Disappointing, I would guess. So since the videos that you used and looked at weren't really, really quality videos. What other options are there for people, either patients or, I guess more importantly, physicians who might be interested in doing biopsies? What are the other options for educating those people? Yeah, so I think based on this study, I think YouTube really is not a reliable source of information, either for patients or for medical students, residents, or dermatologists who want to learn how to do these nail biopsies or at least explain the procedure to patients. There are other resources. Probably the best would be to uh, learn in person how to do a biopsy from a nail specialist or a Mohs surgeon. Other options would be to have didactic sessions, cadaver-type sessions where you can do a nail biopsy on a cadaver nail. The AAD also has some resources, so there is a hands-on nail surgery course at the annual meeting where you can work on a cadaver nail, and there usually are at least 10 nail specialists in the room that kind of walk you through it and assist you in doing this. That sounds like a, a much better approach than you two. Is there anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with about learning how to do nail biopsies or at least learning how to tell your patients about nail biopsies? So for patients, I don't think there's really a great resource out there for them to learn other than being educated by their board-certified dermatologist. Certainly, there's a need to put more patient education materials out there that really explain the procedure in detail. In terms of medical students, residents, and attendings who want to learn more about nail biopsies, I think probably the best way is to find someone at your own institution or to even seek out someone who would be willing to teach. I often have visiting medical students, residents, attendings. I'm willing to teach everyone how to do these procedures. I do a lot of them. But again, I think taking the hands-on course would be another way to get some nail biopsy experience. But there is a need for reliable information for dermatologists and students and residents to learn more about this. And I do think we have the resources to put together a good instructional video. Great. Well, Dr. Lipner, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a very educational discussion about nail biopsies. Any other comments? 
Thank you so much for having me, Dr. DeLeo. And that concludes this edition of Dermatology Weekly. Derm Weekly is produced by MD Edge editors Elizabeth Meshkati and Melissa Sears. The peer-to-peer portion of the show is produced by Melissa Sears and hosted by Dr. Vincent D'Elia. His guest this episode was Dr. Sherry Lipner. The news portion of Derm Weekly is produced by Elizabeth Meshkati. Stories were originally published online by Megan Brooks and M. Alexander Otto. The Managing Your Practice column is written by Dr. Joseph S. Eastern. All MD Edge podcasts are produced by MD Edge and Medscape Editor-in-Chief Dr. Ivan Aransky, as well as MD Edge Executive Editors Kathy Scarbeck and Mary Ellen Schneider, and Multimedia Editor Terry Rudd. Derm Weekly is produced, edited, and engineered by Tyler Mundek. For all of us here at MD Edge, I'm Nick Andrews. You're listening to Dermatology Weekly.